Welcome to Market Radar. We're not investment advisors, security analysts, or brokers. The following information is strictly for entertainment and educational purposes only. None of the information here is intended as a buy or sell recommendation. Welcome to another Market Radar podcast. It's July 23rd, 2022. The uh, market did pretty good this week. The year-to-date performances... S&P is now down 16.82%. NASDAQ is down 24.09%. Russell is down 19.3%. And the Dow Jones is down 12.18%. We're still in risk off. All indexes are still bearish trend, pretty deep bearish. So we still got some time till they go bullish. Um, we've got a 78% chance of risk off. We're now at 41.9% uh, chance of stagflation, slight pullback. Deflationary odds also pulled back to uh, 35.6%. Let's look at uh, what we're expecting next week. Pretty big week next week. Monday, not so much. Um, no market moving events on Monday. Tuesday, we've got Case-Shiller Home Price Index, Consumer Confidence, New Home Sales, and that's it. Wednesday, big day. So this we've got Durable Goods Orders, International Trade in Goods, Pending Home Sales Index, EIA Petroleum Status Report, and the FOMC Announcement and Fed Chair Press Conference. So this is the big day, big day everyone's been waiting for. It's going to be an exciting week. Thursday, also a pretty big day. We've got GDP, uh, jobless claims, and EIA natural gas report, and the Fed balance sheet. So that's also a pretty big day. GDP numbers, everyone wants to see what those are going to be. Friday, we've got personal income and outlays, employment cost index, Chicago PMI, and consumer sentiment. So that's also a decent decent day this past week es had a pretty nice rally continuing on the bear market rally yeah um i also like to note that we are now at upper vamp right so um after rallying off the um lower after rallying off lower vamp in july we were we're pretty much stalling here as of right now, as of uh, Friday at upper vamp, um, which is above the J- the late June highs. So we're still holding above that, but we are um, pretty extended from lower vamp. We have about 567 basis points of downside and uh, 234 basis points of upside. So we're well past mid vamp, meaning that uh, downside risk here is is uh or downside risk is favorable towards upside while this can grind higher um the odds there's more there's more uh room downside than there is upside short term but not to, not to say at the least this can definitely get up towards upper um excuse me this can definitely get towards momo over the next few weeks uh in that case we would be adding shorts heavy up here because that's where we have the best risk to reward from sizing in aggressively in this type of environment. Yeah, unless the environment changes by the time we get there, that's the game plan. And right. it is pretty possible to get there. Like everyone shorting late, getting squeezed out could definitely yeah. drive a, a pretty hefty bear market rally up to moment. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's what I, I guess I want to leave off and clarify is that while um, ES is near upper vamp right now and downside risk is favorable, you can still get a move to Momo. So don't think like, oh, we're at, we're at upper vamp, go heavy shorts, this is it. Over the last you know three months, that's been the case. Upper vamp um, has been something that can be faded or, or was faded very easily. But when you see price congest like this, like it's been doing um, for the last two, three weeks, Right here, which now coincides with up with uh with, with the um where we are today and upper vamps right above it, meaning price has been basing. It can push higher and basically push upper vamp up, and it can ride upper vamp similar to what it did here. 
see how it rode up her vamp. Yeah. Like, yeah. And yeah. something like this destroyed. What ended up happening was everyone saw this move. Uh, first two, three days, time to get short. And you get squeezed all the way through. And that's pretty much what we did. We shorted ES here. Yeah, but we, we, we took a little squeezing. We took a little squeezing, but we understood that the regime had our the regime's wind was in our sails, and this was more short term than anything else. We go through Momo, um, trend stays bearish. We push back lower, go neutral trend. We held the shorts through neutral trend as um, it's not really a significant update within uh, the regime. Still held, held the risk off, and before you know it, we were back in bearish trend, and the shit continued to hit the fan. So. That is how we pl we played that. Remember, we didn't go short here. Um, many people were like, "Oh, look, you know, you can you can be really artistic and you can draw all, you, all the lines you want." Um, you know, they said, "Oh, this is broken, so we're going here, you know, or we're going back up here." Triangle fills, you know, square fills, whatever geometry you want to, you know, use <laughs> in reality. Um, Momo was here. We wanted to short up against it. Knowing the regime was in our back, we could hold a little squeezing. So long as the regime basically was in our favor, we were going to hold. And that has worked out great so far. And we're going to continue to stick to our guns. If we get a move to Momo, we'll size back in. Um, but there's a lot of things happening next week, as you just heard, between GDP, FOMC, and a bunch of other market moving events that where this goes next week could be lower vamp, could be lower, or could squeeze, depending on what happens. So... Um, for us to tell you that we know where the market's going next week, obviously no one does. We can just tell you that odds favor downside, upside is not unrealistic. So um, if you're short, as we are in the public account, understand you can get squeezed here. We're okay with that. Also understand that uh, you know this can drop lower, and the shorts in your account, if you're over leveraged, now probably isn't the time to be cutting them. The time to be cutting them was lower here. Okay, so from the perspective of where, and if you're late to the party where you're improperly sized, uh, the best thing that you can do, and this is the best advice, again, this is not financial advice for you. Um, we're not financial advisors, but this is more of, of advice that has helped me very early on is if you have a position that is oversized, take it off immediately because the emotional stress that you encounter while trying to figure out what to do is most of the time not it's not worth it most of the time so you're better off just sizing back clear your head and then go from there instead of trying to figure out if you're gonna get the move lower to, to exit or get squeezed higher and get margin called you don't want to be in that situation yeah so, well especially with the current market climate that we're in right now it's yeah really not the time to be using leveraged leverage and going in with size in any trade that you do Right. As you can, and for those that don't know, we hold leverage positions in our account, but um, they're a fraction of the, the allocations are a fraction of our account value. We have over 50% of our account in cash. So while we have leverage positions, the allocations are so small where half of our account is still in cash for this specific reason. Volatility will persist, um, and that will make the, the economic climate and trading climate very difficult to navigate. So don't get burned and chopped and lose all your capital because the proper uh, or the risk allocating regimes, if it's risk off or it's risk on those solid regimes, not this type of stagflation garbage, they're going to come again. And you want to have enough capital to make sure that you can basically punch the ticket with full force and get and, and, and put some positions on that get you paid. And that's not going to happen if you're sitting here burning up capital in no man's land. So that's just something to keep note. And I think we can go right to bonds with that, right? Um, speaking of no man's land, right now, ZN, we're, we're pretty much stuck here. I mean, we're trading yeah. at the same place we were back in April, right? Pretty much, yeah. The past yeah. two days were pretty hefty. Good, good yeah. two solid run-up days. But, you know, it's it seems like it's kind of playing out how we predicted it's going to be choppy. It's going to be choppy. Yeah. It's going to go sideways, not really choose a direction. And that's just not the conviction trade that we're looking for. That's why we're staying no. away. No, what we're looking for is this. 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 Yeah, okay? exactly. We're not, we're not looking for this. This is garbage. Even from here to here. Gains, sure. Garbage, though. Because 
I'm going to go into this putting size on. I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh man, let's get to, let's get to Momo and take the position off because realistically this goes to Momo. It can very well go, go much lower. Oh, yeah. like, like that, this is exactly what happened here. Look, all the people were thinking, oh, bonds, you know, bonds are the place you buy the bonds. They're going to, they're turning around, get rejected here. Not only do you get rejected and chop, you, you, break drastically lower now this is obviously a different climate than where we are today a lot has changed but you get my point things can it can go up here very well retrace 50 percent, chop around and and you're pretty much going to get burned with um the decay of leveraged products yeah. and if you're using futures that's unless you have an adequate account size i would not recommend those listening to us that are new to trading to dive into futures right away. The public account is set up so that um, it's set up from an approach that if I were to go into this new and I were not to, and I were to have no no uh, experience, no real assets or account size, what would I do? Again, not financial advice. You can do whatever you want. If you want to do futures, you feel free. Go ahead and do futures, but um, it's not something I would personally do. Another thing uh, to I, note is. I I don't think I've ever seen talk about I, I don't think I've ever seen this many people talk about bonds as I do today. You know, pe everyone's talking about bonds. People yeah. that ha that don't know shit about bonds are talking about bonds. Something That's that interesting. everyone yeah, has to keep in mind. Bonds bonds are slow, you know? Bonds they don't move much. If, if you're allocating a position into bonds at the incorrect time, you can really just miss out on so much just wasting capital holding holding a position in bonds you really have to wait for the proper moment to really capture the moves or else you get stuck in chop your portfolio doesn't do shit and you just miss out yeah and um i think that's where we can leave off with bonds and dive into the recap from last week right yeah let's do so it Let's go into what happened last week, the uh, the recap. The housing market index estimates uh, were for a 65 number, which would be a decline from the prior reading. The number came in at 55, which was declining. So uh, this also posted the largest point drop in the index since the record 42-point loss in April 2020. Housing start estimates were looking for a 1559 number, which would be an increase from the prior reading. The number came in at 1559, which was a decline. Sales, excuse me, um, U.S. home construction fell in June to the lowest since September after plunging the prior month, driven by a slide in a single family in single family home, home building that underscores waning demand. Now we had existing home sale estimates. They were looking for a 5.35 million number, which would be a decline from the prior reading. The number came in at 5.12, which was also declining. Sales of previously owned U.S. homes fell in June to a two-year low as the surge in borrowing costs continues to erode affordability. And then we had the Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index. The estimates were looking for a 0 0.8 number, which would be an increase from the prior reading. The number came in at negative 12.3, which was obviously a decrease. Yeah, that was that was a big miss. <laughs> yeah, obviously, that's a big miss, right? So on top of the Fed's measure of future business outlooks for business, uh, excuse me, on top of this, the Fed's measure of future business outlooks for business conditions slumped this month to the lowest level of 19 excuse me, lowest level since 1979, as gauges of future new orders and planned capital expenditures both deteriorated. So after all this happened, after all these numbers came out, specifically the Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index on Thursday, we saw the December meeting expectations for the effective federal funds rate forward curve slide 11 basis points from 356 basis points down to 344 basis points throughout the session. And this gave reason to the Twitter talkers talking about the Fed pivot. Um, but in reality, this is not a substantial slide. 
uh, it's more important to note that market, like what the market participants were thinking in the case that um, the Fed may not have to do as much, but there still aren't any rate cuts priced into the next 12 months. So is it really a Fed pivot? Because remember, for there to be a Fed pivot, the Fed has to reverse. The Fed not hiking is not so much a pivot because the not hiking aspect was already priced in. There are no rate cuts priced into the next 12 months. A rate cut being priced in would be equivalent to a Fed pivot, right? If there's no rate cuts being priced in, then and the Fed is peaking, no longer hiking, then there's no, there's no real pivot because the Fed's already expected not to stop hiking. Yeah. Right? So... Finally, we also had we had a few more numbers come out on the end of, uh, after P after the uh, Philadelphia Fed excuse me Philadelphia Fed and then um, which was jobless claims and then following on Friday was PMI flash composite. So let's just go over jobless claims real quick. The estimates were looking for a two hundred forty thousand number, which would be a decline from the prior number, but that number came in at two hundred fifty one thousand, which was an increase. So in recent weeks, we've heard giants like Apple. Google, Meta, and Microsoft all saying that they're slowing hiring in a time of global economic uncertainty. Regardless, though, outside of this, labor markets remain too tight to suggest that the economy is heading for an outright recession, but the risks continue to rise. So remember this. The labor market remains tight overall, which is not what you're going to see in a recession. We said this over and over again. Um, the labor market is tight until it's not. Things move very quickly, and as long as the unemployment rate remains under 5%, the Fed has room to run, and they won't even flinch. And that's our opinion. We've stated this over and over again. The Federal Reserve's main mandate is price stability and maximum unemployment. As long as the unemployment rate remains under 5%, the Federal Reserve will keep pushing until they break something. Their main goal is going to be to get prices under control. Yeah, they want price stability, but as right. soon as they start seeing people getting laid off, a lot of unemployment, that's when the Fed pivot will happen. That's when they have a reason to pivot. What's their reason to pivot now? There's right. no reason. Remember, it's the seesaw. We explained this last week. Maximum The employment on one side and price stability on the other side. To balance it out, one has to get pushed the other way. That's the balance. They have to weight each one. Okay. Do we need more unemployment to bring to basically lift the unemployment rate, which will drop prices or push the unemployment rate down, which will create demand and prices go up? That's the weight that they have to play. Now, we also on Friday, this is the last one of the recap. We had PMI flash composites. Uh, remember, these are preliminary readings. So manufacturing PMI estimates, they were looking for a 52 number, which would be a decline from the prior reading, but the number came in at 52.3, which is actually higher than expected while still declining, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it declined, but it didn't come in as bad as expected. Now, service PMI estimates were looking for a 52.7 number. This was estimated to be in line with the previous number, but the number came in at 47, which was a decrease. Now, this is the lowest print since May 2020, excluding the pandemic, though, the July figure, the one we just saw, was the weakest in record back to 2009. So what this is telling you is manufacturing is holding or is bouncing a bit, right? It's coming in less than expected, but it's basically declining, but not as much, whereas the services are getting absolutely gonged, right? Now, the composite PMI estimates they were looking for a 52.4 number. This would have been an increase from the prior reading. The number came in at 47.5, which is a decrease. Now, the important thing to remember about composite PMI is it's broken down into two levels, the north and south of the 50 mark, right? So anything above or north of 50 is seen as the economy expanding, whereas anything south of 50 is seen as the economy contracting. So a reading of 47.5 is indications of a contracting economy now again this is a whole reason why everyone was moving towards the fed pivot all this nonsense no that is not what the fed the fed the the, 
the Fed is going to try and break unemployment or break employment, boost unemployment. When the Fed has broken the jobs market, they have broken inflation, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. If, so, if people don't have jobs, they're not going to be buying shit. <laughs> exactly. So just keep that in mind when you see all this nonsense like GDP. So, for example, GDP might might slow down, right? We have GDP coming up. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Will that affect the Fed? Maybe. Uh, we had some commentary from Powell this week as well, or, co- or a commentary from a survey, or I think it was from Bloomberg. Bloomberg surveyed. Um, don't quote me on it, but there was a survey. I don't from who I cannot remember, but the survey went out there and they basically gauged if Powell was going to slow rate hikes, and it came back as yes, Powell's going to slow rate hikes after the um, seven after the rate hike this month. Meaning the September meeting is going to be slow is going to be slower and so on and so forth. The Fed's not going to have to do as much. I think that's kind of bullshit. I'm going to call bullshit on that one. But I mean, I don't, again, I'm going to use what the market tells me. The market's telling me that, that the forwards curve is peaking around 300 and, um, 40, 340 basis points or 330 something basis points. Um, that's where it is right now. Can that change? Yes. But to say that Powell's going to pivot with, in, with CPI at nine, over 9%, kind of bullshit because if you well it's not kind of bullshit it is bullshit because if you think about it like this for the federal reserve to really battle inflation in the past they've had to raise the federal funds rate above the rate of inflation that pretty much kills it right Mm -hmm. so where are we right now we're We're at 150 way way off yeah we're at 158 basis points maybe after all these rate hikes we're at what by March, or I mean, excuse me, by uh, by December, we're at three, three hundred and twenty, three hundred and forty, right? In also, that range. like this is very sticky inflation. You know, it doesn't just yeah turn around, yeah. do a one eighty, and you get back to two percent within a few months. That's not how it right. works. You know, this it, right. for inflation to go from nine percent back to two percent could take over a year easily. Right, and I think the I think the important part there is. If these are going to converge where the federal funds rate is going to overlap inflation, I'm not saying it's going to happen at 8% or 9%. But I'm saying is I don't think it's going to happen at 3.4% either. Yeah. Well, like inflation right? could pull back to 7 or 6%, but they're still going to be hiking to pull it even lower. Yeah, exactly. But as of right now, the market's telling – that's my own opinion – I can think of, I can do with it what I please, but the market's telling us that the Fed doesn't have to do that much unless it get 340 basis points. So keep that in mind. Understand that logically, I don't see that as really happening, but I'm going to have to, I'm, that's what I have to believe. Uh, my opinions are there. Um, they don't mean as much as the market does because at the end of the day, who knows what happens? The market is always right. If the market is going to move, it's going to be because of certain things not abating. Now, um, why even bring up my own opinion then? Well, it's, it's simple. It's, I have an idea of what's going to have to happen. Um, if I believe that, think of it this way, the fed's going to be hiking until December, right? By December, we're going to know if they're going to continue to hike afterwards. We're not going to get to December and be like, well, just new rate hikes are coming out of the woods. Like they're, they're just getting priced in. It's going to, sl- it's going to be a gradual process where the curve slides up over time. Yeah. As so it, what is- as it gets closer, it becomes more right. certain. Right. Um, and if there are any more rate hikes, they'll be priced in accordingly. Very rarely, uh, almost never, is there zero rate hikes priced in and the Fed does something crazy. So just remember that the market is all-knowing. The market is ahead of us. The market is smarter than us. So always put more weight in the market than my own opinion. The reason I give you my opinion is because of this. It's basically setting myself up for understanding that the stagflation will most likely be stickier and last longer than than expected, right? Can can there be a deflationary deflationary price action or a deflationary move within the stagflationary regime? Yeah, absolutely. But what's the wor- what's the goal of trying to precisely catch those moves when the bigger picture remains that this is a chop or get chopped regime? Basically, if you fuck around too much, you'll get your head cut off, and that's not what we're trying to do here. This is not a um, an algorithmic daily, weekly trading fund that we are basically 
moving capital in and out as fast as we can, trying to steal ticks, trying to, to steal pips, none of that bullshit. That's not what we're doing here. We're trying to get the big picture down, leverage that big picture, get paid, and keep moving. This is not about being right short term, being wrong. We'll tell you when we're wrong. This is more about catching the moves as they come. So let's wrap up everything we've spoken about so far in the context of the Fed, right? Obviously, the Fed pivot, the action behind it is merely just Twitter squawk at the moment. Oh, yeah. Right? There's, it's there's nothing be. backing it. Nothing backing no, it at all. No. And if, you, and if you look at... So this is very interesting. So the peak of the forward curve, it was at 3.6 or 360 basis points uh, at the beginning of this week, right? Right, right around there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It slid lower. Now we're at 340. Right? Oh, big deal. Oh, my God. Fed pivot. But we're only back to where we were in the, in the start of July, meaning we've the, the Fed curve, uh, the, the forward curve rose but came back down. So, but it's, it's where we were at the beginning of the month. So how I don't see the Fed pivot. Yeah, like, there's, there's no pivot being priced in at all. Right. So, and as we've, we've said, until the, the Fed breaks the employment situation, or I should say the, the job market, Everything is on track for the Fed to do whatever they have to do. So patience is required with this. And I think we can, we can push on here and we can go over to um, the composite PMI. And this is, I'm going to go over this quickly with you guys. This is the 50 mark that I was speaking about earlier. Anything above the 50 mark is considered to be economic contraction, Right. So you the last below, time below everything below the 50. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Any anything below, excuse me. So we are now below 50. So this is the second time it's happened since 2014. Last yes. time was COVID. Yeah, and then 2016 we had what seems to be a narrow uh, encounter. But yeah, last time was COVID. So yeah. this is something to watch. And then we have GDP coming out this week. Um this is something that we should pay attention to. Because we had the, the first, and this is on a quarter over quarter, this is a, a quarter over quarter percent change. So this is down negative 1.6% quarter over quarter in the first quarter. And the estimates, believe it or not, are for a plus 0.5% change, a 50%, a 50 basis point, excuse me, 50 basis point increase, not 50%, 50 basis point increase. In this quarter we'll find that out on friday on uh thursday right yeah and th- this yep. is this is important watch watch all the uh macro gurus out there update all their f- numbers and forecasts and shit because this gdp print comes out just remember it's yeah. all delayed data if you're yep, basing that- your decisions on this delayed data your your strategy is a losing strategy yeah, it's it's kind of bullshit, right? Like like you said, this will come in whatever number it is. If it's negative, if it's positive, whatever it is, um, it doesn't really matter. It's <laughs> it, it their models change. So for example, look at this. We have the 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 quarter over quarter advance. This is not the final, right? This is like the the pre, it's like a preliminary pre- preliminary, right? So we have the negative one point six, which is the previous. The consensus is point four. Trading economics is at a 0.6. Uh, Bloomberg actually has it at 0.5, so it's in between this. So if this comes in at negative 2, right, negative 2%, say something stupid, right? I, realistically, um, that's way, way outside of consensus. But if that were to happen, all the models that you see, because if the consensus is wrong here, it's wrong, across, it's, it's, it's wrong going forward. It's kind of like a, a chain... A chain link. If you move one chain over, it fucks up the rest of the line. Yeah. So y- you move this over, something happens here, their models get screwed, and now it's all about like, oh, things are changing in real time, and their forecast model, whatever, they're now cast, this cast, whatever bullshit cast they want to talk about, you know, you're better off going to the beach and casting your fishing rod, because like, in, re- <laughs> in reality, this is some bullshit. It is. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. watch out for that. Keep, keep an eye out on that, because... Right. You know, that's how everyone's models are. We're the only ones that do what we do. It's funny, a uh, little history. We actually started, you know, when we first started building our regime model, that's kind of what we were doing as well until we realized yeah. it's all bullshit. Yeah. Um, 
that's a good we'll get into a little back backstory real quick here before we move to the um to the charts we came into this looking on how to make um efficient model programs basically that will simplify um and outperform the S&P 500 now, there's not many things that can outperform the S&P 500 just because of the nature of what the S&P 500 is. So just remember, the S&P 500 is not a simple living organism. Things are getting dropped and added all the time, so it's very dynamic. So companies are being ranked higher. Weightings are being increased and decreased. So there's a lot of management that goes on into that, into that single fund that you would call SPY. Um, or the S&P 500, that index is managed. Now, it's not actively managed, right? It's more of a passive index that will move, but it, it, it moves. The whole point is, is that that thing changes over time. So to backtest that, you can't... What I'm trying to say is, if you're going to try and beat SPY, Apple has a bigger weighting today than it did in 2000. So the components are always changing. So you have to understand what you're trying to beat. You're trying to beat an ever-growing organism now there's many ways that you could attempt this but the whole reason is why is spy doing what it's doing the spy is doing what it's doing because the market participants are telling it what to do meaning spies bidding really really hard in a straight line up like it was in 2017 2018 where we had those mega rallies why because liquidity was in excess there was a lot of it the market was in a place where it could run, right? So not only SPY was running, but all the indicate all, all the gauges within SPY, all the sectors, all the allocations, all the all, all the market sectors broken down into the regimes into the respective regimes were running as well. Now you can take this any way you want, but if SPY is moving, the underlyings are doing most likely the work prior to, meaning. The more I'm not saying prior to as in weeks, but those un, I'm saying is in days, right? The, the, the underlines will update and the spy will move. So if you can spot the updates on the underlying surface prior, and this is not some forecasting bullshit, none of that, right? You're, you're spotting the way the market's pricing everything in real time. And as that shifts, the and usually those shifts last more than a few months or a few more than I would say on average, I, I believe it's four, it's like four to six weeks. So or six weeks on average. So anything over six weeks is, is normal for this. So excuse me, anything up to six weeks on these, and these shifts are normal past that things can change. So what I'm saying is as something shifts, you have about a six week runtime with the market before like another shift will occur. Well, what kind of and shift, what kind of shift do you mean? A, a regime shift. Oh, a regime shift. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like, as, so like, for example, we shift to inflation odds are we're not shif shifting to another regime in less than six weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. The market's going to stay sticky like that uh, because a lot of money is moving in and out of the market. The market is not something that um, it's not an, an intraday algorithm because think of it like this. Everyone that's listening to this podcast, myself, everyone that can refer someone to this podcast most likely is a small fish. OK, like in reality, the amount of capital we have access to is very small compared to what these big funds are doing. Like if you look at Bridgewater with 120 billion, right? Like they are allocating capital in such a manner that they have to over diversify because they cannot hold a lot of one thing because they will move the market. They are in a completely different ball game than what we're playing. We can play concentrated. We can play leverage. We can play directional. We can do all these things because the our asset, our assets under management are not aggressive enough or not big enough to be aggressive enough when we're taking positions to really change the environment we're playing in. Mm -hmm. I got a, a fun like Bridgewater. They put on a position and it's wrong. They have to scale out that position. Do you know that they can't sell that position in one day? They have to sit there and sell that position over a few days, depending on the size, maybe even a week. Yeah. And they're so they're pretty much allocated in everything. Just yeah, exactly. They're, they're weighted differently depending on what their outlook is. Right. So to sum up what I what I was basically explaining about what our work here is, we're trying. This is not as complicated as you might think. While it is very complicated at the same time, and you might say that doesn't make sense. Well, it does, because 
the market is not very complicated in the aspect of that it will know what it needs to know when it needs to know it and price it accordingly. When someone says the recession is priced in, I hope that's not what that's not what that's not what the market's doing. The market's not pricing in a full recession if the recession has not happened yet. How do have you had a recession when jobs numbers have not broken out yet? Yeah. The market is not pricing in jobless claims go I mean, excuse me, the unemployment rate above five percent. It's because kind of that was... it prices in based on the odds as of now. So right. if you have let's say a twenty percent odd of a recession, it's going to price that in accordingly. It's not going to price in a full blown recession. It's going to price in twenty percent chance of a recession. Right, exactly. And for example, the unemployment rate is at. 3.6%. If the market was pricing in a recession, a employment rate blasting through 5%, you'd you'd see rate you'd see the market pricing in rate cuts right now in the next 12 months. But it's not because that's not what's being priced in. Like you just said, it's the pricing in proportional rates of everything occurring. The market is well balanced. The market is not some third you know, a secondary exchange where back in the day where, you know, you want, you called up one broker, he had a price for silver that was a percent or 2% different than another broker. And you're like, oh, okay, I can just search these prices. And that's not what it was. That's not, uh, excuse me. That's not what it is. And that was more, that was more of not commodities. That was like the pink sheets. And that was really just due to commissions. That wasn't even the, that, let's not even get into that. That was yeah. some bullshit anyways. <laughs> um, the good old days. We, yeah, we have the we have the FOMC looking for a seventy five base or expecting to do a seventy five basis point rate hike uh, this week. Uh, this has pretty much been priced in to the uh, forward curve since the last meeting. So, when the Federal Reserve hikes seventy five basis points, maybe they do a hundred. I don't know, but I I know that the market says they're going to do seventy five, so that's what I'm leaning with. Uh, I just want you guys to remember to all the people that told you that 75 basis points is stupid for the next meeting. Not going to happen. Fed pivot. I want you to remember who said that. I'm not going to name any names. And I want you to remember how many other people said bonds are the safe place to be right now. The Fed is done hiking. Buy the dip on bonds. All the people Buy the saying dip on that bonds. for the last Since like, March. six months. <laughs> yep. Since March. All the people that told you to buy the dip on bonds... You don't have to shove anything in their face. Just remember, where are they now? Are they buying more? Are they just averaging in? Think about, excuse me, think about it. What are they, what's the purpose of what they're doing? Why are they telling you to do these things? Because they have a model that is delayed or not accurately representing what the market's pricing in. We're in such a unique period that if your model's not organic enough and doesn't have enough machine learning components within it, you're not going to understand, the model's not going to understand what is actually going on and you're going to be like some of these guys calling deflation the last three months, six months, a year. It's not. It's not deflation. How many people have told you that inflation will pe- inflation has peaked for the last eight months? Yeah, exactly. And our system right? has just been sticking to its guns. Yeah. Not falling for and any his- of the traps. And historically, our system does very well in picking and choosing. Look, we're going to get things wrong. We're going to tell you when we get things wrong. We're going to tell you that we, when we get things wrong because we're going to be pissed that we didn't make some money. But guess what? We're not that pissed, though, in the grand scheme of things because it doesn't really matter. As time goes on, the regime, this, the system catches meat, uh, the meats of every almost all the moves. So the meat of almost all the moves, excuse me. So what are we worried about? Like, this is not... It's okay to be wrong. So the people that are like, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that, you're going to be wrong. Most of Wall Street has been wrong the last six months. They're just too stuck up to admit it. It does not matter. We will all be wrong. The matter that, what matters the most is getting the regimes when they matter the most right. If you don't, you're missing serious compounding uh, potential and you're really just hurting yourself in the long run. That's why we like leverage, but we use it very precisely and we take our time to understand the landscape those are the three things that i'd leave off with you with this but let's go into the to the charts now let's talk about the dollar um the dollar is up uh last week 
we kind of slid a bit, but we are just around mid vamp right now. Well, and... last last week was honestly a very deflationary week. Yeah, it, that, easy, that it it's was. easy to get caught up in it. Yeah, you yeah, know, I know. You, you see the I... dollar sliding. You see commodity sliding, crude oil down. You're seeing bonds, bonds the last bonds two go. days, ZN ripping. It's easy to get caught up in it, but you yeah. just got to remember the big picture. This is all price action. Could right. we be switching to deflation? Yeah, anything's possible. But why be this early? There's no reason to me, get in this let, early. Let me, let me tell you something, too. Those people that say deflation is coming, the, the dollar has topped. I don't think they understand what deflation is. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's that like makes sense. De- deflation. The dollar would be ripping. The dollar has been ripping, right? Yeah. And this is this is this what is... has got a lot of people. Yeah, really it's confused. confusing everyone. I know because they feel like, man, the dollar is up. It's got to be deflation. That doesn't know. It's not the case because if you look at bonds, they're they've sh- they've literally shit the bed this year. So it's like you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Let the market tell you as a whole, not these individual assets. That's what we were saying earlier. But yeah, so long story short, the dollar's pulling back a little bit. We're in mid vamp range. Um, this can go to lower vamp and be, be fine. Look what it did back here in May. We came down, oh, the dollar, the whole, was, I think this was the David Hunter time, right? Yeah, I think this was. was. It? Is that when he started? I, I, I no. I, I mean, think he's, he's been wrong for longer than that. No, no. This is when I think we made our David Hunter video. I mean, at this point. Yeah, I think he's been wrong since January. Honestly. Yeah, he's he's it's, been it's, wrong it's too pretty long. Pretty sad. <laughs> he, he's been, he's another one. Just admit that you're wrong and, and stop like you're putting yourself in a position that you will eventually be right. Like we all know that you'll eventually be right. The problem, like a melt up. Yeah, there's going to be a melt up on spy. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. I, I, in the next. Five years, two years, yeah, there's going to be some sort of melt up. But like you've been pe- leading people down the narrow road that it only goes down right now and people are getting hurt. Like it's terrible. Yeah. Like, why? I, feel, I feel bad for the people in yeah. his comments. I see them commenting, just saying, like, hey, I've been following you since January. Can't wait for the melt up. Like, Jesus, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah. It's and sad. I think we dropped, uh, yeah, I think we dropped the, the uh, that video, that, that podcast that we did talking about his points around this time i'd have to look yeah. but it was somewhere it around might here have been around there yeah yeah and the market since and then he was i'm pretty sure the tweet that he had this last week he, he tweeted like okay this is the top in the dollar this is what's going to happen blah 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 pretty sure he tweeted that exact same tweet in may when the dollar Maybe he... when the, the dollar peaked there like i swear i didn't find the actual tweet from back then but I vaguely remember it, and it seems like it's word for word. We'll have to we'll have to see if we can do like a before and after. Yeah. Um, but what he was saying was the dollar. I, I know that one of his tweets this week was the dollar peaked, which means we should see some relief in the uh, in the Australian dollar, and I think it was the he said it was gold. the Australian dollar. Did he say gold too. I don't know. It was the Australian dollar. I'm only gonna want to quote what I remember, and then he said likely meaning that we will see some relief in the euro and 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 the yen and that in itself is some bullshit okay i'm gonna add like i'm gonna shoot the shots where they're respected because that is some bullshit if you see some relief in the dollar it is mainly mainly because of the bid in the euro and the yen it is not because you will see this happen if the dollar the the only reason the dollar will catch a bid or cat or start puking is because of the euro and the yen yeah, the euro the and the yen make largest. Yeah, it's, it's over seventy percent of the dollar is the euro and the yen. So how could you, how could you not put enough emphasis on the euro and the yen when you're talking about the dollar? That is the main component. If you're looking at the dollar, you and you're not looking at euro and yen. We look at euro and yen. I post tweets every morning for you guys. We cover them every morning because they're the most important thing when you're looking at the dollar. The euro is the most significant dollar component. If this is not bidding and not, not really reversing. And this is not bidding and really reversing, which look what we saw on Friday. We saw a bid here, right? In the last week, if I were to, let me see if I can overlay this for you guys, DXY, right? Look, look familiar? Yeah, if and I, that's, not I, a, that's not a trade. He kind of made it seem like it was a trade. Like, okay, look, you see 
the U.S. dollar pull back, so then we expect the euro and the and the yen to go up. It's it happens at the same time. Right. This That's is not the a dollar. Trade. <laughs> you no, can't see the is... dollar pull back and be like, okay, I'm gonna buy some euros. I'm gonna long euro. This is this is the dollar inversed against the against the the yen. The dollar is down, right? Inverse, it, it's up, but on, on, on a regular scale, it's down because look at the yen, it's up. Now, if we look at the euro, same thing, up, off the lows. This is not this is not some rocket science. If you're thinking the dollar is going to peak realistically, and I and I'll say this every single time, if you think the dollar has peaked and you think the peak for the dollar for the next ten years is in, you better be loading the boat on euros and yen right now. You better be like that's what you're buying. Yeah. If you don't think, if you think the dollar is top is in, it's going to go down. You should be long euros. You should be long yen. But instead, no. You, most people don't understand that the dollar is a function of the euro, of the euro yen and and GPB. They are the top three dollar components. They they will move with the dollar. There's no like, for example. The Australian dollar is nowhere near as correlated to the uh, uh, to the U.S. dollar as the British pound. Mm -hmm. And I think I can uh, I'll do another for those watching and not listening. Um, I'm going to inverse this again just so everyone can see. This is the British pound. You can almost see and let me see if I can put a different line on here. We got the blue, the, it, the blue and orange lines. They're, they're trace. Uh, let me take DDAP off. They're basically chasing each other. Right in the same direction. If I look at the Australian dollar, it's a little bit different. The, it deviates a lot more, mm -hmm. and that's, that's because that's based on trade, right? That's based on that, how much, yeah, the two countries yeah. trade with each other. Yes and no. It's it's all it was really based on the components. The Australian dollar is nowhere near as big as the British pound in the dollar index. Yeah, right? but I mean the the weighting is based on how much trade happens between I, be countries. I believe I believe so the weighting's been fixed for many years though it's not dynamic Oh it's not okay No this I is the it biggest was dynamic Oh yeah no this is what we've been talking about the last few weeks um I guess no this is this is why I've been making such a fuss the last few weeks about the euro If the euro goes basically gets gets destroyed they're going to have to reweight the dollar index because if this thing drops 50% the dollar index is going up like north of 20% from here oh yeah so like that's a problem so uh, that, that's why i'm like say I, this is 50 something percent of the dollar index the euro so it's very very important that the european people and the bank the bo um the ecb excuse me they figure this shit out rather quickly because they're gonna lose a lot of like i mean I, I don't even know why i say this anymore they're gonna lose respect who respects them who respects any of these people anymore they're just a bunch of crooks. They sit there and they tell you what, you know, oh, who could it, like, we, we think this is going to happen. And then they just. Yeah, no, act, none of them saw no, inflation no. coming after yeah. printing half the money supply in a year. Yeah, like, like, what? Trans, like inflation is transitory, right? Yeah, okay. No one Infl saw it coming. <laughs> like, yeah. what? Inflation <laughs> is transitory. And then they would, then, then, then Powell gets to sit on a stand and say, well, we, it's about, it's time that we retire the word transitory. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, how can you be that wrong and still keep your job? Yeah, but how could you be that wrong and just say, looks like we're going to retire the word transitory? Like, oh, like, it, it's, it's almost like me going, you know, committing murder and me saying, well, uh, it's important. It's, it seems that murder is a felony. It's okay, though. We're going to just retire the word murder and we'll keep going. Like, y y you can't commit the acts, like these acts, and you want to call them acts of violence against our monetary system, because that's really what they are. You, you can't commit these acts of violence against everyone's purchasing power, and then just say, yeah, we're going like, to oh, retire sorry. the term. Yep. Yeah, sorry. And we're going to just, uh, we're going to just fix the problem. Sorry like, that, like, 10% of your savings just vanished. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry you lost your job, you know? Uh, or... When, when the time to hike rates, when it was ideal, sorry, we were too busy buying stock. We had to sell our stock, though, before hiking rates at the beginning of the year because it was a conflict of interest. Yeah, literally sold yeah. it at the peak. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. It's a joke. 
But um, let's let's pivot to the next section here, which is real yields. We haven't spoken about these in a while, and I think it's good that we we should, it's good that we're going to dive back in real quick and refresh everyone on what's going on. So early this year, we were very adamant about real yields going higher. We pretty much called this whole real yields move. We were long, we were basically short tips, uh, which is basically long. It's inversely shorting tips is long real yields. So we went long real yield somewhere in here, and we longed this whole rally up. We caught this whole move from negative 1% pretty much to positive um, 50 or no, 60 basis points. Now, what does that mean, though? Well, f as of the current situation, real yields are a signal of a tightening economy, economy that's getting tighter. Financial stress, all, all this other stuff, tightening financial conditions, real yields go up. Gold is inversely correlated to real yields. Now, the gold bugs can debate me all they want on this. I'll argue all day because at the end of the day, I'm right because I did my research. I am not being sold some inflation propagandist bullshit about like how, you know, the, the, the money supply is going to go to, you know, your purchasing power is going to get eroded at hold gold. That, those are basic, that, that verbiage, uh, verbiage is coming from individuals that are selling physical gold. There's a lot of people that make good commission selling overpriced gold to people that don't know what's going on. I remember a few months ago, oh, and it was more like six or seven months ago, I was sitting at a restaurant and I overheard a conversation of someone saying, you gotta buy gold. I know a guy that can sell you gold, physical bullion. And I already knew what was going on there. The gold brokers making anywhere from, or the, the individuals, the reps selling this gold, is probably making anywhere from two to 5%, depending on what gold they're selling. Some markups are even higher and it's, you know, it's bullshit. You're selling someone something. Now, what purpose do you have to buy physical gold? If the, we're already in a digital economy. Well, that, the whole argument with physical gold is the collapse of the entire monetary system. The dollar is collapsed. And you basically go back to bartering. And you you trade gold for goods. You know what's really crazy? But why about would you that? bet on that? <laughs> that's just. But do you know what's real? Do you know what's really crazy about that whole thing? What? Is that's the same argument they use for Bitcoin? Oh yeah, exact same thing. And it's except they fight each other. It's crazy. They use the exact same argument, but they fight each other at the same time. Yeah, but it like at the end of the day, betting on that and gold bugs have been around for a long time. Way longer than Bitcoin, but oh, way yeah. longer, yeah. way longer. And yeah. where has it gotten them at the end of the day? They put all their capital. It, the funny thing is with these kind of people, a lot of time diversification goes out the window. You know, it's like yeah. buy Bitcoin and their entire net worth is in Bitcoin. Buy gold, their entire net worth is in gold. That's kind of a similarity that I've been seeing with these people. And at the end of the day, you're betting on a complete collapse of the monetary system because that's when it really pays off. Yeah. And you know what? Let, let me add this into the into this whole concept. The anyone that tells you gold is an inflation hedge has no idea what inflation is, nor do they have an idea of how gold works. Yeah. Gold and as, is at as the you could see now, it has gold is at you the at gold is at the same yeah, that, we'll get into that in a second. Gold is at the same price as it was in 2011. Meaning if you bought gold in 2011, you've made no money. And there's been consistent inflation, inflation since 2011. Consistent. Yes. So where do you make money? What's gold good for then? Gold is good for deflationary environments when real yields are collapsing. Notice when real yields collapse, gold, pretty much when real yields bottom, gold peaks. Yep. It's, and this yep, is a that, correlation that, that no one talks about. No one talks about it. For some reason, people can't get this through their head. They don't understand that. This is what it comes down to. If real yields are extremely negative, right, or dropping, gold is an alternate to bonds. Right? Mm, when okay. real yields yeah. are, all gold is, is, is basically a bond proxy. Watch this. I'm going to overlay TLT, right? They move the same. They literally, uh, let's take off, let's take off gold. See that? They go up together and they go down together. Yeah, so it's like inversely, they're both inversely correlated to real yields. To real yields. Right. Yeah. Now, you buy gold 
you buy bonds. If you think real yields are going lower because other investments are less attractive, okay? Uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, other investments are less attractive when real yields are falling, and you're able to buy these things as they appreciate and more people chase them. Real yields at 1.1%, um, 1.4%, 1.14% as they drop, bonds and gold become more um, desirable. Once real yields start rising, bonds, get, bonds go down, the real rate of return in the outside in the economy goes up. So why hold gold? Because you can get better returns elsewhere. Mm -hmm. at, uh, what I'm saying is a real yield at 0. Point, uh, 0. 0.41, right? As this, or a real yield, it was, almost, it was up at 0. Point, it was at 80 basis points um, a few weeks ago, a month ago. Is that 80 basis points? That's more, comp that's more compelling to investors than negative 1.15, right? So as rates fall, they, it's more compelling. The case becomes more and more compelling to own bonds and gold because the financial conditions become basically uh, the, the sh not, I, should, I don't want to say stress, but the environment becomes less desirable for capital. Yeah. And it, basically right? the way the way everything works is money always gets allocated somewhere. Money just shifts, right? So if it's right. shifting That's into bonds, if it's shifting into bonds, it has to come from somewhere. It'll come from equities. Equities will right. sell off. Right. And that's where the whole 60-40 portfolio idea comes in. Yeah. Uh, and long story short, bonds and gold move together. Um, and they will they've diverged in the last six months. And we've sp spoken about this divergence rather in depth here um, in the last, uh, all this entire year, actually. Yeah, since like now, January. Yeah, since January, that real yields, as they basically rise, bonds have gotten destroyed, but gold hasn't. So what's that telling us? Is that telling us that gold still has downside risk? realistically if you look at gold here gold was here when real yields were negative one now real yields are basically positive 41 basis points and gold has gone from 1800 an ounce to 1700 an ounce this has held up remarkably compared to bonds it almost makes me think like if real yields stay sticky up here gold continues to sell off much fat much harder than bonds do like this gap in my opinion will close yeah, and I could see that gap being fueled by inflation. You know, everyone thinking yeah. gold is an inflation hedge, so they're buying gold. And that's kind of been holding it up this whole time. Yeah, and it's, it's. I mean, it hasn't really, though, because it's been fading, right? But I know what you're saying as inflation. Yeah, it has, it has yeah, like yeah. some bid from, yeah, it has some from bid. retail. Yeah. Maybe it's retail. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Yeah. <laughs> but I let's let's take a look at Bitcoin. Let's talk about Bitcoin because we didn't have time to talk about that last podcast, which we wanted yeah. to. Yeah, this thing this thing has gotten destroyed uh, this year. We are down right now. Let's do the math for those watching. Uh, we are down sixty eight point two percent. That is rough. Meaning, meaning, for you, for anyone that bought it, will be conservative. Anyone that bought it at sixty thousand. They need this to go up 173% Jeez. to break even. Which, I mean, Bitcoin can do that. It has done it in the past. Oh, no, it's not a matter of if it can. It's a matter of if it, uh, it, um, when it will, not if it can. Because we know mm -hmm. Bitcoin can move 100%, right? That's not the thing. The question is, does Bitcoin stay like this for two years? Mm -hmm. Because remember the last time we had this type of price action was here. Bitcoin did... Bitcoin went up and then declined, but it did nothing from August of 19 all the way till really breaking out in November of 20. Yeah. And, and that whole and time, higher. no one talked about it. And this is really more comparable because this was way more parabolic. So this move was way more parabolic in 2018 than it was in 2019. Obviously, liquidity has changed. Money has come into this. It's a bit different than it was before, right? Uh, it's a much bigger asset. Um, but it's still down 70% off the highs. Uh, in 2017, it went down 83%. So we're, we're almost there, right? But from the peak to peak, it took 
2017 to 2020. It took three years, pretty much. Mm -hmm. A little around three years. I mean, if we do the, we can probably, it'll probably tell us exactly how long it takes right here. A thousand ninety eight days, over a thousand days to break even. So yeah. if you you want to do this little time, I love those the guys on Twitter that are like oh time cycles like they they'll tell you exactly when things are gonna pivot based on like the moon and shit. Yeah. yeah. Really <laughs> um, based on but a thousand. Signs. Yeah, but a thousand days has this going back up over. Um, oh, was it September twenty twenty four? We're gonna see new highs if if you were to use those cycles. Which again, I who the fuck knows? That's from some bullshit saying that. I'm just telling you that last time this happened, it took till twenty twenty four. For Bitcoin to go back up to its all-time highs, so that's not. While it's a stupid way to look at things, it's not out of the question if you look at the way the regime is working. Right? We're in stagflation. We haven't even hit deflation. Imagine stagflation lasts another three, six months. That's not out of the question. Yeah. As well, stupid as that, or as shitty as that might feel, that's not out of the question. Then we get a, then we get three, four months of deflation. So we're already a year out. Just think about that. Then for Bitcoin to run from there all the way up, it's not out of the question. It's it's probable. Now, could could everything change tomorrow um, and we go into a different regime? Excuse me, on Monday, we go into a different regime? No, that's not going to happen. But give it a couple weeks, something can change. Because for this Bitcoin to change, it's got to go, literally for Bitcoin to change trend, we have to go up over 64%. Is that going to happen in a day? That would, I mean, that would be the craziest thing. But it's, again, Bitcoin's volatility, this can happen in a week, no problem. But why is that going to happen? Why has it not happened already? Why, why would people take on risk right now? That's my point. So until the risk environment improves, Bitcoin's debt. It's debt capital. And um, DDAP had you out here around 50K, um, gave, giving you multiple liquidation events, you know, right around 45, two, three times before really getting destroyed, which... We spoke about that happening here with the 2018 lows, which were here. We said that we were we we basically slammed the table. We told you guys this was going to happen, not to you know not to set, not to be cocky or anything, but like this was avoided. If you got caught in this, you just either didn't know us or didn't listen to us because we tried our best to make this clear that this was not the place to be, and it still is not the place to be. When it is time for it to be the place to be, we will let you know. Because believe it or not, Bitcoin has one of the best returns out there in um, the time periods, or I, I should say the best annual returns out there. It, the amount that it moves in a, in a given time period a year is one of the best performing assets that you can find. Now, long term, if you look at it, it's also one of the volatile and one of the most, um, you, you, one of the most uh, largest or most I should say one of the assets you're going to experience the biggest drawdowns with. Mm -hmm. That's the way to phrase that, yeah. right? You just got like you got to make sure you get out right in time. Right. And um uh, I think we're going to finish this off quickly and talk about the ANFCI because that's something we want to talk about. We we spoken about this all year. This is the financial stress index. We were so sitting up at 0.13. We spoke about this last week about this blowing out. In the last week or so we've declined. We're sitting at 0.02. Um, so financial conditions are still above average uh, in in stress. Does this decline a little bit? Sure. But um, that doesn't mean that the market is saved because as you can see, we spend a lot of our time under like this point, um, this negative um, like 40 area. Most of the yeah, time it's spent over there. It's got meaning. a long way to go to normalize. Yeah. And the big problem is, is look how far this has deviated from VIX. Yeah. The last the last time I think I've seen something like this is probably 2016, right? It was deviating. I mean, let's put a weekly chart on here. Maybe it can show time period. Yeah. Like the last time if we go back in time here. The last time we had such a big deviation was uh 2016. Well, look at the deviation where, in 2008 as well. Yeah, I mean, that this went up like here b before VIX spiked up like oh, crazy. Oh, this. Like look yeah, at that. Look yeah. at the NFCI. Yeah. Up there at like what? 1? Is that 1? And then yeah, that was the that VIX, <laughs> the VIX was just getting crushed. Just a VIX huge was divergence, crushed. and then all of a sudden, doop, yeah. zoom in higher. And that's what that's what we're seeing now. We have the ANFCI way up here and VIX down here, and it's um, 
we know financial conditions are only going to get tighter, right? Unemployment is only a 3.6%. We're not even above 5% yet. What happens when we get there? Because if you don't think, again, the Fed is going to hike until they break something. Odds are there's no soft landing. We're going to get a recession. Now, the, the, now they're going to tell you the definition of the soft landing will, will shift. Oh, it's going to be a light recession, a shallow recession. But, but, but and before you know, we're in a deep recession. That's just how this shit works. They're going to tell you this stuff. They're going to try this stuff and they're going to fail because they are their government entity. There's lack of responsibility. No one needs to take responsibility for what they do. So no one really gives a shit about what they're doing because at the end of the day, it's they're there, do it, do their terms, peace. That's it, right? They're going to do some of them are going to try and do their best. Some aren't, but they're, you're not talking about the overachievers of the world in government. They are in the private sector. Yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong. There's no there's accountability. No, right. Now, I want to clarify. There is nothing wrong with government employees. That's that not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, think of it from a government employee's perspective. There's no incentive for you to go above and beyond because you're not compensated accordingly. Right? Like, if you work nine to five at a government job, you're given a list of what you have to do. If you don't exceed those things, you're, if you get paid the same as if you do exceed those things. Excuse me. If you meet those goals and then you exceed those goals, you get paid the same. Mm -hmm. So there's no point in you, like, putting in late night hours and working and trying to improve um, to get that extra, that extra raise because that extra raise is not as significant as in the private sector. Like, you're not going to be the CEO of the government. Yeah, exactly. You don't work your oh, way up to right, <laughs> right. And that's not a hate against government employees. That's me telling you that it's the interests are not aligned with the way that the government is structured. The people that work for the government, their interests to do the best for the people that that live that are, inhabit the country are not there because at the end of the day, the government subsidizes everything when something goes wrong anyway. So there's no account. There's no real like, oh, it's your fault. You're to blame. You can get in. Like the, the no Fed chairman, like no matter what Powell does, hikes interest rates, puts us into a deep recession, soft landing. Like if he does a soft landing, what's he going to get a, a, a bio in a book somewhere? If he puts us into a deep recession, is he going to go to prison? No. So what, what does it matter to him? Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Right. So it's like, what is the problem? There is no problem. You understand? Like, what is the solution? I mean, there's no solution, not the problem. What is the solution for these people? They can do what's expected of them. The Federal Reserve has mandates. They're expected to do these things. They're expected to have price stability and maximum unemployment, and they're going to do those things. Yeah, they, that's that the means, bare minimum, and they're yeah. going to do the bare minimum because yeah, right. why would they go above and beyond right. just and that? In reality, and that's in reality, why the Federal Reserve doesn't work. Right. And in reality, the Federal Reserve should have been proactively hiking rates last year in anticipation of what could have happened this year. Now, would they have slowed the economic um, expansion? Yeah. Sure. But will we be in the mess that we are today? Probably not. And on top of that, before even hiking rates last year, they should have never stimulated the way they did two, year, uh, two years ago. So it's almost like they keep, they keep you, know, you know the term kicking the can down the road? But every time they kick the can down the road, they throw another can to kick with it. So they're just compounding the cans they're kicking down the road. It's, 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 <laughs> they've got the to they've be at like 65 cans now. Yeah. They just keep kicking. Yeah. 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 You would think, if you saw them on the street, you'd think they're a homeless drunk. But like <laughs> they're the Federal Reserve of the United States. I know. It's ridiculous. But we have to take what we have. And honestly, I, I thank the Federal Reserve for their inability to take action and, and go above me on because it leaves so much market opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, because if you know that they're going to be they're going to be behind the ball all the time, which they'll never be in front of the ball. They're always going to be behind the ball, and if they're always going to be behind the ball, that means we have the chance to be in front of the ball because the market is going to front run them. So if we can see what the market's doing, we know what they're going to they're going to do, and we know the only opponent to the market is the Fed. It's like when you were a kid and you played the video game, the final boss, the final boss is the market. And the only person that could beat the final boss is the fed. So if you know that they're matching and you know that the fed is always behind, you're going to just take the final boss uh, basically on the money line. Every time you bet, right? You know, the final boss is going to win. The market's going to win. So we bet with the market. We're bound to be winning. Mm -hmm. And that's literally our strategy and why we read the market. But I think that's where we can leave it off today.
uh, and we'll come back next week with another recap speaking about what we see with the Fed and the minutes. Um, if you have any question questions, uh, feel free to message us in our Discord. Um, the link to our Discord can be found at www.market-radar.com. Our Twitter handle, you can see, find us on Twitter as well, is at themarketradar.com. Oh, excuse me, at the market radar. Yeah, just com. at the market radar. At the market radar. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>